Hello and welcome to another Acrylico tutorial. Please watch until the end for many tips and tricks you can use on your future projects. Before we move on, I'd like to thank Derivative as well as our Patreons for their support. Please subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification to support us into making more tutorials like this. For more tutorials and downloadable files, check out our Patreon and our Gumroad. There you'll have the chance to purchase toy files, tox files, HD and 4K renders. For 20% off, just type A code as a discount code on the check. Out. I'll leave all the links in the description. Now on to today's tutorial. First I drag and drop the track I want to use followed by a null. Then I'll add an audio device out to output the track. And in the parameter window I'll set the device to a virtual device I have. Then this will only allow me to record my voice and the audio at the same time in different channels. So you don't need to do this step. Then let's right click after the null, go to add operator and we'll add an audio spectrum chop. This will calculate and display the frequency spectrum of the input audio. Then let's right click and create a select and in the parameter window let's set the channel name to chan1 since we only need the one channel displayed. Let's right click and we'll attach a trim chop. We will use this in case we want to shorten or lengthen the input's channels. In the parameter window, let's set both start and end units in fractions. Then, by actually changing these values, we can trim or append to the existing channel. Now, if we check out the info of this chop, we can see that the length is 48,000 samples per second. This is very high and what we actually want is something closer to 60 FPS. So, to convert it to FPS, we're going to attach a resample chop. In the parameter window, go to Common and toggle on the Time Slice parameter. This feature keeps our chop channels smooth even when our overall frame rate goes down or our timeline skips frames. Now, if we open the info, we see that the sample rate is where we want it, but we have very little samples, only 20. You can also recognize this in the graph, you can tell that it's very edgy, and this is for the lack of samples. For the animation, we want to do some instancing and we'll be needing around 1000 samples. If we were just to stretch this, then we'll have more samples, but they'll still be edgy. So instead, let's first change the resample method to new rate, new interval, since we want a new range of 60 as well as a new longer interval. So to set the new interval, let's change the unit value to absolute and the end value to 1000. Here let's make sure also that the unit of the end value is set to samples instead of seconds, otherwise we'll end up with too many samples again. Great, now we have 60 samples per second and 1000 samples. Press Alt and N while clicking to create a null after the resample. And now we're going to convert the whole thing to tops by adding a chop to top. Converting the whole thing to tops will set the size to 1000 and in a mono 32-bit format. We need to remember this for later for the sizing of the particles. Now let's attach a noise after the null. Go to the Output tab and we'll only output the noise. Back to the Noise tab, toggle off the monochrome and then in the Common tab let's change the format to a 32-bit format. Let's attach another null after the Noise and we'll rename this to Position, color it red and we'll use this later for the instancing. Let's attach another null, this time after the chop to top, and we'll rename this to size. And 
Great, now let's create the actual instancing network and then we'll come back here to tweak the values. Let's press tab and create a box swap. Right click and attach a transform right after. We want the size of the boxes to be really small, so let's set the uniform scale to 0.001. Let's right click after the transform and attach a geometry. Later we're going to attach the rest of the comps, but first I'll split the screen and set the second screen to Geometry Viewer. Then let's right click and make sure that the Adaptive Homing is not activated. This will keep the animation from being messy once we make it audio reactive. Great, now let's open the Geometry Parameter window, go to Instance, toggle on the instancing, then drag the position null and drop it onto the translate op. Then set R, G and B for translate X, Y and Z. Then let's drag and drop the size onto the scale and set the R channel for all three scale parameters. Ok, now maybe the boxes were a little too small, so I'll go back to the transform and decrease the uniform scale to 0.01 instead. And another thing we notice here is that the boxes are positioned on this side of the coordinate system, and I want to position them on the origin. The reason why the visuals are positioned like this is because the noise we added goes from 0 to 1. So if we attach a math after the noise and set the two range minus one to one, then the boxes will move towards the origin. Now here we notice that the size of the instances is already reacting to the music, whereas the position not yet. We notice the boxes are not actually moving, so let's see how we can fix this. We know that this null down here contains the audio data. Let's go ahead and attach an analyze chop after it. The analyze chop will look at all the values of the channels and will output a single number result based on a function we choose. So for example, the average function will output the average of all channel values. Great, after the analyze, let's attach a speed chop. The speed chop takes speed in units per second and converts it to distance in units over a time range. So it will take a chop rate as an input and it will output a cumulative value. This is like calculating the integral in physics, where the curve is the incoming channel values over a time range and the output is the area underneath. To visualize this, let's see with the help of a trail chop. If we use the speed chop and we send a constant chop channel that has a value of 1, then the speed chop output will increase by 1 every second. If we feed it 10, it will increase by 10 every second. And if we feed it 0, the output will not change. So positive values will increase the accumulated value, whereas negative values will decrease it. And the further the value is from zero, the faster the accumulated value will grow. This property makes the speed chop a great operator to use for audio reactive animations. Hopefully this is understandable. Let's attach a null after the speed and we'll use this to translate the position data of the noise. The noise is already connected to the position. Let's open the parameter window, go to the transform tab and in the translate Z parameter we'll drag and drop the null as a chop reference. Great, and there we have the audio reactivity. As we saw before, when the music is low, the movement is also slow and when it speeds up, we also have more movement. This looks really nice and up to now we're still on the default values of the noise parameters. We can play around later with these values. One thing that bothers me here is that the size of the boxes is so small at the parts where the audio is low. What we can do to improve this is set a minimum value of the size and then have the boxes grow from this minimal value. We'll do this by adding a math operator before the size.
Go to the Multi-Add tab and in here we'll increase the pre-add value. This value is going to get added to each pixel of each channel. I'll set this value to 0.3. This will guarantee that we'll be able to see the boxes all throughout the track, even when the audio is very slow. If we were to add another math and increase the multiply instead, then this will increase the size of the boxes whenever the kick of the music hits. Great, this already looks very nice, so you can decide to skip or change the parameters of the noise to your liking. Now on to the rendering. Let's create a camera comp, a light comp and a render top. I'll switch the top viewer and attach an all at the end of the network. I'll call it BG for background and turn the display on. Before the null, I'll attach an RGB key to get a black background. Now for some post-processing, let's attach a bloom from the palette. In the parameter window here, we can change the parameters to give it a different look. Then let's attach a blur before the bloom and you can go back and forth with changing the parameters and try out different versions. And if you want to use other colors, just add a lookup top after the RGB key with a ramp in the second input and select other colors. And this was it for this tutorial. A second tutorial based on a similar technique but with more advanced usage is already on our Patreon for everyone who is interested. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching until the end. I hope you enjoyed watching and learned something useful. If you have any suggestions or questions, leave them in the comments and I'll see you next week with another tutorial. Until then, have a great time. Bye bye!